evening. A month ago, the Prime Minister sent millions of school students home for a second time. How many weeks are there still to go? And what impact is it having on young people? Welcome to COVID and the Classroom. Reopening schools must be our national priority. And the first sign of normality beginning to return should be pupils going back to their classrooms. By February half term, um, pupils across the UK will have missed out on about half a year of normal schooling. We recognise day in, day out on our children's faces when we see them on Google Classroom or on Microsoft Teams, that desperation that they want to be back at school. Lots of people I think will be scratching their heads and say, how come our schools are closed, but our borders are open? We do need a national long-term plan to get us out of the educational swamp, because I worry that long after coronavirus has gone, we will have an epidemic of educational poverty in our country. Well, last week we looked at the wider issues caused by the school closures. On tonight's programme, we're going to be focusing on the challenges facing secondary age students. With six young people at different stages of their school careers. You saw most of them there in that opening video. And a very big welcome to all of you. Well, also with us tonight is Taryn Kapoor, the chief executive of the Dean Trust, which runs a number of secondary schools and a former secondary school head teacher of the year. And a very warm welcome to you too. So let's start our discussions tonight with an aspect of a young person's education which can easily be underplayed, the benefits of spending time with their peers. And for all the many different problems associated with school closures and homeschooling, one of the main concerns for parents is the social effect on their children. A YouGov poll for Ofsted last month found, when parents were asked the main challenge for their children, that 38% said lack of contact with classmates. That outweighed the lack of contact with teachers at 35% and was significantly more troubling to them than the many difficulties of access to the right device for home learning. Well, let's bring in Kira now in Carlisle, aged 17, who missed taking GCSEs last year. And now in your first year of A-levels, Kira. And sixth form is normally such a big change, isn't it? Is it hard that you're not sharing this formative time with your, your classmates and your friends? Yeah, it really is. Like, it's very different just being at home. This is the kind of time where you think you're really socialising with everybody. It's a kind of a different aspect of school. And it is, it is different. Obviously, you can ha see people on Zoom. But it's just not really the same, especially when in sick form you have your freeze and you have your lunch time. And just being with your peers who also share the same interests, you're doing the subject you really want to do. Like it really influences you when you're in school. And it is very strange not having that around you and doing all your work by yourself and, and just being like in the house alone. Yes, the house all the time, it feels like, doesn't it, for many of us. And do you find it uh, difficult to get motivated as well, to stick with it? Um, at first I did. I think I've got a bit more used to it now, but you definitely have to be very self-sufficient, very self-motivated. You have your Zooms that are scheduled, but there's a lot of work that you're left to do for yourself in your own time when you get chance. So, yeah, I've kind of got into a routine now, so I'm kind of trying to stick to the normal school day. So I'm trying to keep everything, you know, in check and on time and meeting my deadlines. But it is difficult to motivate yourself when you don't have set lesson times and, like, the teacher's there to kind of give you that extra push. 
Yes, it's all about trying to structure yourself, isn't it? Kira, thank you for that. And certainly that reliance on your phone, your laptop or your tablet for your interaction, as we all know, is not the same as a face-to-face -face conversation. And for secondary school children, there are some big decisions that need to be made. How much harder is it then to do that when your school is closed? What GCSEs you're going to do, what A-levels you're going to do, or for someone like Kira, the university applications that you've got to start thinking about. So let's talk now to Trey in North London, one of those wrestling with some of those life choices. And Trey, you're 14, aren't you? So that's, uh, what, year nine. Having to choose your GCSE options soon. Are you missing chatting it over with your friends or even your teachers? Yes, I'm really missing, you know, being at school and being able to communicate with the other students. And, you know, it's, it's quite hard as well that I've got my GCSEs picking them you know, right around the corner as well. So it's very... You know, it's, it's quite a lot. And, and Trey, just very quickly, um, does the day feel longer for you um, being at home? Did you, did you get homework on top before? So the days have actually been feeling a lot quicker. And, you know, sometimes with homework and schoolwork, sometimes I can still be on the laptop doing my work till about five o'clock, six o'clock. So, yeah, but definitely, I think the d days have felt like they've been going a lot quicker. The fact I'm, you know, only staying in one place in my house. Indeed. So, well, Trey, thank you. Good luck with those GCSE choices, of course, as well. Uh, now, one of the biggest issues has, of course, been those missed exams. Last year, with the added stress of an algorithm helping to decide grades, an approach subsequently, if you remember, ditched, this year, Scotland and Wales decided fairly early on that pupils would have missed too many lessons for exams to go ahead. England has now followed, but what impact does all of that have, the uncertainty uh, and the problems last year? certainly. Well, Roman is in Stockport. Let's come to you now. Uh, you're 15. You had been due to sit your GCSEs this summer. Has the uncertainty been difficult for you and what does it do to your motivation? Yeah, it's definitely hard to motivate yourself when you don't know what you're working towards. Um, with uncertainty, it's hard to know sort of why you're doing all these online lessons and why you're working so hard because it's not that traditional format and I think that does make it really hard to motivate yourself to go that extra mile in year 11. How does your school manage home learning? Are you online all day or are you working mainly on your own? Um, some lessons, the more practical lessons, um, are do setting us work and then just leaving us to it and some the more um, academic are guiding us through things. Um, but we do have a structured nine to three still, just like we would if we were at school. Roman, thank you very much indeed for that. Yes, it's all about trying to get this structure in your own day, isn't it? Which is really difficult when there's so many distractions around. Uh, well, the question of the harm to young people from the lockdown has been causing concern for many senior specialists in education. Earlier this year, Ofsted's Chief Inspector of Schools in England, Amanda Spielman, set out the case for why schools should stay open if possible. She said, children's lives can't just be put on hold while we wait for vaccination programmes to take effect and for waves of infection to subside. We cannot furlough young people's learning or their wider development. Well, sadly, soon after she made those comments, all schools were indeed closed. The cases of infection spreading too rapidly to allow them to stay open. So how damaging is it being off for so long? Let's talk now to 13-year-old Tina, who's also in North London in year nine. This is the second time you've all had to do this, isn't it, Tina? Does it feel more normal this time? Have you, have you kind of got used to it? Yeah, I have got more used to it, but I think it's not a good thing because this has become my normal, just sitting in front of a screen all day. And every day just seems very repetitive and it's all a blur. It feels repetitive. And do you find space to work? Do you have, do you have distractions at home? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, my phone's right next to me. It's really hard to discipline myself and make sure I engage myself in the lessons. What's the bit you miss most, do you think, about being in school and around uh, friends and classmates? I think definitely talking to my friends. And that gives me motivation to engage in lessons and work harder. But now that I don't have that, it's hard to um, make sure I listen and do all the work in time.
Yes, I think you're, you're spelling it out for many people. At your age, you've got the distractions of interactions, haven't you? And if you don't have that, and it's all about schoolwork, it feels much more stressful. Hina, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, experts in child health have been stressing throughout that while it's best for the control of the virus more widely that schools be closed, the damage to children is clear. So children and young people under 20 make up, they're about 15 million in our population. They make up about 23.5% of our population. And we have closed, when we close schools, um, we close their lives, not to benefit them, but to benefit the rest of society. And in fact, children and young people, when we close schools, they uh, reap harm from that. Well, let's bring in Taryn Kapoor, then, who oversees 10 schools in northwest England. Wow, we're talking about huge numbers of young people across the UK, aren't we? 15 million for whom this has an enormous impact. What are you most worried about, then? Is it the bits, as we've been hearing there, about missing out on social interactions, about seeing your friends? Or are you more worried about the pure education that people are missing? Yeah, there's a number of eating out. There's a number of things I would say. First of all, certainty for parents can be stressful, but uncertainty for parents and for young people is unbearable. And the mental health issues and the well-being issues are just surfacing each day. In fact, in school today, one of our secondary schools, we had 70 phone calls that were made this morning to our children who needed somebody to talk to, somebody to be kind to them. And the joy of being in school is lost. And I've charged all my head teachers with a start in September, which is almost to reinvigorate not the academic, but everything else that's good about school, everything we remember about school. And it isn't the lessons. In fact, many children are sick of lessons because that's all they've had. And parents must be, when they hear that phrase, remote learning, it must make their hearts sink. So we're concentrating now, trying to raise our heads and not just our schools, I have to say, many schools, raise our heads up to the parapet and say, right, we know what's happening with the, um, uh, the pandemic, but in September we anticipate being back in properly. We'll be in any, after Easter, but I think that will be social distancing and bubbles and children will get sent home and brought back into school, as they have done. But September is the key date for me. And is there any specific year that you are most worried about? <sighs> well... Year 11, obviously, because last year was straightforward because they completed most of the course and we had evidence. This year, some of our year 11, who were year 10 last year, have missed nine months' worth of work. And the consultation took place last week and 50,000 people signed up to it, including almost 25,000 young people. And next week, we're supposed to hear something about the plan. Not having a plan is more stressful than having a than having a plan that isn't very good, to be honest. So year 11, I'll be concerned about. Also year 10, who have exams next summer. But actually, if you think about the year sevens, they didn't have any sort of celebration when they were in year six. They always have their leading assemblies and shows. They started in year seven. They've not had a proper induction. And they don't know many people. Speaking to one yesterday, and he said, sir, I love coming in school, but I'd love the rest of the school to be here as well. It is really sad about that. That, that is true, isn't it? It's not being able to say goodbye at the end of your education. It's not making friends at the start of it. it it's all, it all is tricky. Uh, Mr Kapoor, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, Scotland has now announced the date that younger pupils can return, all being well at least, the first three years of primary, but also those in older age ranges whose practical work around exam years means they need to be in, such as art or music. So let's talk now to Elpida in Leeds, age 17, year 12 then, hoping to study medicine at university. And Elpida, you're finding it hard to get the relevant experience, is that right? Yeah, because if we were at school, we would have done loads of clubs, club work and work experience, and we would have gone out and gone to different uh, industries and workplaces to try out for work experience. However, now it's all virtual, and it's because it's virtual, there's limited places and harder to get into, and so it's a struggle to get involved as much as you would like. You also started a new school, didn't you, for sixth form? This is not the easiest way to bed in and make new friends. Yeah, it's been kind of crazy because we started friendships and we got kind of close, but not to the extent where we could talk every day via online. And so it's we made close friends, but then we separated for a really long period of time. So it gives hesitation on how it's going to be when we go back.
Well, oh, Peter, thank you for that indeed. Uh, schools are still open, of course, bear that in mind, to those whose parents are key workers or they are deemed vulnerable. And it is a juggle, certainly, for teachers to do both. The online learning that they need to set or be envisioned for for those at home and teach those in class or wherever they're put uh, to stick to social distancing rules. I know some people we spoke to last week have been working in offices. And a lot of children also have a couple of days at school and then a couple of days at home, however the school can accommodate accommodate them. So let's introduce Brooke now, aged 13, so year eight in South East London. And Brooke, last lockdown you were at home because you, both your parents are key workers. This time you're now at home. Which did you find better? Um, well, neither of them was perfectly ideal because most of my friends' parents aren't key workers. So I didn't really get to spend time with many of my friends and stuff. But being at home and being at school, they're quite two different uh, surroundings because school was quite loud and the amount of people that were there, there weren't many, but it was still, like, there was still noise around. But being at home, it's more quiet and you've just got your family around you and it's hard to talk to the people that you don't see every single day. That is indeed true, isn't it? Brooke, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's shift focus now. And while the social aspect of education is fundamental to a young person's well-being, school is also a vehicle for social and economic advancement. Each day of school education lost has a cost to the young person involved, not just now, but also for the future. And not just for themselves, but for the wider economy too. By the middle of this month, children will have lost half an academic year. That is 5% of their total education in school learning. The World Bank estimates that a year's schooling increasing a person's education on average by 8% a year for a nation like the UK. So, based on the average yearly wage, the Institute for Fiscal Studies estimates that that would mean a potential of £40,000 lost in income across a lifetime. So, even if the government gives additional support to help students, the catch-up learning we've heard about, the IFS suggests there would still be £90 billion in lost lifetime earnings. Uh, but overall tax revenue is hard for young children to compute right now when they are more concerned about qualifications for themselves. So uh, let's go back to uh, Kira then. One of your worries is that you face sitting A-levels next year, having never sat a major exam before. That sounds stressful. Yeah, it is a little bit daunting because obviously we've done our mocks, but we've never done an official exam. And A-levels are a bit of a step up from GCSE. So it's it's a little bit scary to think that we're going to go into our first A-level exam never having had the exam experience yet. And um, at the moment as well, we can't really have A-level mocks as we're at home. So we're missing out on that aspect as well. Kira, thank you. It is prompting some people to think about a rethink about exams, but not for this programme. Perhaps we'll uh, delve into that uh, in more detail in the months to come. So we'll catch up learning then, catch on. How would you feel about, first of all, teaching yourself at home for some months, several months, and then having to make up lost schoolwork in the summer holidays when perhaps you can actually see your friends and that's where your priority might be? Well, Trey is one of those where all the homework sent home, as we heard earlier, on top of the homeschooling, left some students working sometimes until five or six o'clock at night. You said that earlier, didn't you, Trey? Um, do you fancy catching up then? Do you feel you've learnt as much at home as you would have done in class? No, I don't think we've, you know, learnt as much as we have um, at home. You know, if we were at school, obviously, as we're engaging more, you know, and it's more motivated in class, we would have been able to learn more. And, you know, at home, sometimes it's like, you know, as you're at home and on the computer, you know, it's like, you don't really, sometimes it's like, I feel like I don't, I can't always listen all the time. And sometimes, you know, I might feel a bit tired and I'm not as engaged as I am. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. And I think of my own children as you say that out loud, I have to say. Uh, Trey, thank you very much indeed. Um, it is important to point out that there is a slightly different roadmap for schools reopening in the different parts of the different nations of the UK. In England, all schools will continue with remote learning until March the 8th at the earliest. 
In Wales, the earliest possible date for an end to remote learning is the 22nd of February. In Scotland, we've mentioned already, the government there is looking at a possible phased return to school, also from the 22nd of February, while in Northern Ireland, remote learning will continue until at least the 5th of March, although special schools do remain open. So how will it feel going back then? Let's return to Hina. And how are you feeling about it, Hina? Will it be nerve-wracking for you, do you think, returning to school? Yeah, I think it definitely will be because I haven't socially interacted with people in so long face to face. So I'm nervous about how it's going to be. But I'm mainly excited because after being home from, for so long, I just can't wait to go back to school. Do you find, though, that you become a bit of a homebody and you spend most of your time indoors? Yeah, definitely. Since we're at home, I don't really want to leave the house anymore because I don't feel comfortable leaving the house anymore. I'm just not used to it. Well, we wish you the very best of luck with that and, uh, you know, broaching the big outside. I think many of us feel the same way, I have to say. Uh, well, we heard the Prime Minister say that schools are both safe and vectors of transmission. The concern being that they could take the virus home, the students, that is, and then you would get household infection to parents or beyond. Uh, certainly that is on the mind of Brooke, who has lots of distractions at home, uh, like her little brother, but also worried about the impact of possibly spreading the virus to members of her family. Her granddad has a heart condition. Um, and this is, this is tricky, isn't it? Because you know that you're going to school and you're mingling with lots of people. Did you have a concern then about being at school before Christmas and, and possibly spreading it amongst the family? Yeah, I definitely did because um, both my parents are key workers and my brother's autistic. So, say, if... He was to get coronavirus, or one of my mum or one of my parents were to get coronavirus, then they wouldn't be able to do their jobs anymore, and my brother wouldn't have the normal routine that he's really used to, and it would just make everything off balance. Yes, it, it is a real concern. So let's let's gauge how you all feel about that then. Um, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up for your answer. So the question is, if you could, would you go back to school tomorrow or would you prefer to see the virus figures come down first? Hands up, first of all, for back tomorrow. Fascinating. And hands up then until the figures come down. There you are. Well, that's a resounding, isn't it? That is another big factor in all of this, the awareness of young people to the dangers of this virus. So let's bring in Taryn Kapoor again. And your job certainly is to make children feel safe amid the pandemic and try to catch up and fill all those holes of lost education. Yeah, I tend to agree with the, the vote, I have to say. So that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, I've been inspired by the young people who've been on tonight. Remember, it's a mixed economy. and We have many families across the country and many in our schools where they have a device at home, but they may have three children and we are offering live lessons. So only one of them can actually access the live lesson at a time. So whatever we do, live lessons and remote learning can never be as good as being in school. Saying that, I don't think the government can get it wrong again. I think they have to choose the time to allow the secondary schools to come back so we're not going back out again. Because that's the biggest frustration. Obviously, vaccinating the staff would be the right thing to do. Having a big decision in the next week or two about examinations would be good because the, the staff are stressed about that as well. There's a lot of catch-up to do, but I think, going back to my original point, if the children come back to a school that's got a bit of joy in it and they absolutely love being back in, they'll quickly start to catch up. And I think Ofsted and other uh, bodies like that need to give us a bit of space so we can actually start to recoup recuperate, repair and start to move forward. So it's fairly simple, it's common sense, but you know we're ready for it. Um, the young people are right, we have to go back at the right time and then just get on with it and become a normal school. There's too many phrases that we use now which will be part of their history, unfortunately. So just very quickly, are you, are you quite relieved that the exams for this year are not going to happen, even though you'll have to do teacher assessments, presumably? Well, that's not exactly the case, because one of the suggestions is that there would be some form of examination at the end of Year 11. And the Year 11s don't know anything about that yet, because it hasn't been announced, but we've certainly been briefed that there may be something at the end, but we don't know at what point um, 
And it may be there just to help us make our decision because we've not had the children in school for long enough. But until we know that and we have certainty, we don't want to go out to our families and say, this is what's going to happen. And can you imagine year 11's coming back and they don't know if they're doing examinations, they don't know how they're going to get the grades. The demotivation would be incredible. It, you know, the teachers are already stressed with having to work with young people who are thinking, why am I here? Uh, we tried one. to speak to the special advisor of the education secretary to find out about exams before we came on. He didn't answer. They should have done it, shouldn't they? They could have clarified whether or not you're having any. And we could have all learned that. A uh, quick thought then from, from Roman. What are you most looking forward to when you go back? I think just uh, that sense of normality and structure again, um, the way that it is at the moment, that it's just so uncertain day to day that it can be really stressful for us. I think that if we can get back into school and it's safe to get them back into school, that's a step in the right direction and a step towards regaining a sense of um, structure for everybody. Yes, indeed. It's interesting that you all focus on being safe when you go back. That is, that is interesting for us, certainly. And who knew that a generation of youngsters would think so very highly of both school and their teachers? We've certainly learnt to come to appreciate them, whether as students or as parents, I have to say. Uh, we've all also learnt the importance of seeing family and friends and going about our normal business. And hopefully we'll all appreciate that a lot more when the time comes. Even if, like Elpida, you've started a new school, as we mentioned earlier, you simply can't get to know people as well uh, from home you don't have that social interaction um, but m presumably most people are still keen to get back and and start their education back again and so Peter you are you still keen to get back to school still keen to start again doing what teenagers should be doing oh most definitely like we have we had loads of plans for the summer and hanging out with these new friends that we wanted to go out and have, you know, have food, you know, hang out at parks, but it clearly wasn't meant to be. And I can't wait to go back and just regroup as a community because there's the family, but there's also like the school community that we really, really need at this time. And are your parents looking forward to you going back as well, do you think? Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> it's true, I can be, um, well, too many hours in the house with my parents, I'd say. It's probably enough for everybody, isn't it? I think we all we all feel that too. Elpida, thank you very much indeed. Uh, yes, indeed, it's busy households everywhere, isn't it? If you're trying to work from home, many people, of course, are furloughed or they've lost their jobs. The financial pressures are there for the whole family. Um, but from all of them, I just want to say a big thank you. It's all we have time for now. A very big thank you to all of you. Good luck with your decisions. Good luck with your work at home. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And also a big thank you to, to Taryn Kapoor for his expertise. No doubt you've got lots of planning uh, for the students when they come back, should that be March the 8th or later. Thank you very much indeed and thank you for watching.